The year is 2004. The month? March. By now you've heard all about this new DirectX 9 thing and how it's the future of PC games moving forward. Doom 3, UT 2004, Far Cry, Half-Life 2. These are some of the anticipated DirectX 9 titles that have released or are set to be released later this year. But there's just one problem here. Your system isn't going to cut it anymore. That record-breaking 1GHz AMD Athlon chip, the whole 512 whopping megabytes of PC133 RAM, and of course, the trusty GeForce 2 GTS, they were certainly incredible pieces of hardware for the time, but that was almost four years ago now. So much has changed in such a small amount of time. You have no choice but to build a PC. Thankfully, all that money from last Christmas could certainly help you get started, but what to buy? Believing that tech couldn't possibly get any better than what it is right now anytime soon, you set out with one goal. Build a modest PC only from the latest technologies. We want to future-proof this thing. And while we could sit down and break down every little part that you could have chosen, I just so happened to have an Asus K8N Socket 754 system in my hands with an Athlon 64 2800 Plus. So that's what you ended up choosing. Yippee! But what about the GPU? At this point, it was no surprise that ATI was currently the king of GPUs. Nvidia had missed the mark big time with their GeForce FX series, and despite getting a much needed refresher after the initial disastrous release of NV30, Nvidia still wasn't quite able to keep up with ATI. The reason for this was simple. Nvidia cards costed more and were almost always bested by the cheaper, less power-hungry ATI offerings. That, and also Nvidia had so many different offerings of their GeForce FX cards, it just felt overwhelming trying to decide which card could be best for you. Like, what were they possibly thinking with all these random variants? Ultra, non-ultra, LE, XT, like what does this even mean? But back to the point, we want to make something out of the latest greatest tech available, so there's no compromises here. Let's see what we got. So for ATI's high-end offerings, they used the tried and true DDR RAM on a once workstation class exclusive 256-bit memory bus, which was quite exciting for the time, but also quite expensive. Their mid-range cards would see the memory bandwidth halved and use the same DDR technology for the RAM. Nvidia, on the other hand, more or less threw their efforts of trying to take advantage of fancy GDDR2 out the window in favor of copying ATI with the same 256-bit memory bus and DDR RAM setup for the high-end segment of their refresh GPUs, which proved to be the right thing to do in the end. However, in their mid-range segment, they did end up keeping GDDR2 for one GPU, the GeForce FX 5700 Ultra, and that is the GPU we will be talking about today. <laughs> but there's a twist here. You see, Nvidia dropped something seemingly out of nowhere in March of 2004. They were announcing a refresh of the FX 5700 Ultra, this time with a brand new never publicly released memory technology, GDDR3. Now, if it isn't funny enough that the spec for GDDR3 was developed by ATI, yet NVIDIA were the first to actually put it to use, NVIDIA would drop their next-gen GPU series, NV40, or the 6800, the following month in April of 2004. And of course, that started with the Ultra, which used none other than GDDR3. So what exactly is going on here? Why did NVIDIA choose the 5700 Ultra of all GPUs to get a GDDR3 refresh? And more so, why even bother? The 5700 Ultra wasn't exactly a GPU that people were praising for its good value and excellent performance, not to mention it was a mid-range GPU now fitted with a cutting-edge memory technology. So after doing some digging around, these are basically the only reasons I could think of as to why Nvidia would do this. So the 5700 Ultra used to use GDDR2, which is not quite the same as DDR2, of which GDDR3 is based off of, but maybe it was still similar enough that it made switching the chips over to GDDR3 not that much effort? I also speculate that this was a bit of a marketing stunt and it was purely a desperate way for Nvidia to bring home some sort of W after a very, very hard year. I mean, think about it. If you tell your investors that you were the first to use a cutting edge technology in a product, it probably sounds pretty good for them. After a year of disaster, lies, and overall disappointment, 
I'm sure Nvidia needed something to keep their investors happy. I also think that this is some weird way for Nvidia to tease NV40 and show that this time, they weren't going to have any problems. Overall, I feel like it was somewhat of an attempt to prove to people that unlike the fiery flaming mishap of NV30 and GDDR2, Nvidia was trying yet another new memory technology, but this time, they promised it's going to be a lot better than before. So while it was exciting to get early access to GDDR3 and get a taste of what the next gen cards would be like, the fact of the matter is that those next gen cards were right around the corner. I'm talking like a month or two away from being released. And of course, they also use GDDR3. So really, this card just feels useless. It feels like some sort of marketing ploy by a very desperate Nvidia. I mean, it made no sense for consumers to buy this because the next gen GPUs that would use that memory technology were a month or two months around the corner. And for just a couple dollars more, you could get a 9600 XT, which just kicked this thing's butt. And for the enthusiast minded people, while reviewers did praise the overclockability of the RAM, it still doesn't change the fact that this is not a GPU that would work very well in the nope. future. It, it's DX9 compatibility was just very, very bad. And yes, overclocking definitely did make the difference between playable and unplayable in some scenarios, but no amount of overclocking can fix poor DX9 implementation. All right, so I've been yapping for five minutes now. Let's actually look at this card. So let's assume that you were convinced that this card is the most cutting edge technology you can get right now because of its GDDR3 memory. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test this in just a couple of games. We're gonna start off with a game from around the time period, and then we're gonna try a couple other games which would have come in 2005 and then in 2006. We're also gonna do two benchmarks at the same time. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a 9600 Pro or a 9600 XT to look at here and to make comparisons, but what I do have is a 9500 Pro, which was an amazing mid-range card from 2002. So can this mid-range card from 2002 pull anything on a mid-range card from 2004? Well, time to find out. Starting with 3 Mark 2001, we can see that the 9500 Pro does fall a bit behind the 5700 Ultra, simply because this is a DX8 title. Now, at the end of the day, these numbers are very, very high just due to the newer hardware. So either way, these are both very, very, very good scores. But the 5700 Ultra does take the lead to start with. But that victory does not last for very long when we run 3D Mark 2003, which is a DX9 benchmarking suite. We can see that the Radeon 9500 Pro enjoys a pretty big victory over the 5700 Ultra, scoring about a thousand points higher than the 5700 Ultra. Yikes. Unreal Tournament 2003's benchmarking tool shows us that the video cards are basically neck and neck, while the 9500 Pro had apparently 10 FPS more in the flyby than the 5700 Ultra, they were basically about the same in the bot match, and honestly I would choke all of this up to margin of error. So it looks like at this point, at least for this game, the graphics cards are really just limited by the other hardware in the system, like the chipset and the memory and the CPU and whatnot, so I would call this a tie. Need for Speed Underground 2 is an interesting one because despite being a DX9 title, the cards performed very similarly. The 9500 Pro I would say won simply because it had a higher max, but when playing the game, it was about the same experience on both cards. And now on to Juiced, the Radeon 9500 Pro scores its second proper full victory. However, I need to specify something here that's kind of important. Unfortunately, Juiced is a game which has V-Sync stuck on. There's no way to disable it. So the 5700 Ultra probably had a bit more in it, but because it could not hit a consistent 45 or 60 FPS, the game unfortunately locked it to run at 30. When it came to fear, the 9500 Pro enjoyed its first landslide victory. The 5700 Ultra could not even produce any sort of somewhat playable frame rates with DX8 shaders disabled, so we had to go and enable those. However, just to give you an idea of how horrible the 5700 Ultra was here, I disabled DX8 shaders for the 9500 Pro, so it was running with DX9 shaders, and just look at how good those numbers are. Way better than the Ultra. But ending on a slightly more positive note, Flatout 2 from 2006, with its pretty decent graphics and its pretty intense physics environments, shows us that it is a pretty optimized game. Both the 9500 Pro and the 5700 Ultra enjoyed some pretty decent numbers. However, of course, the 9500 Pro ended up winning this time. 
I think the takeaway here is that anything that has a lot of intense shaders is not going to run very well on the 5700 Ultra versus the 9500 Pro. Now that said, if you do lower the resolution to 800 by 600, the 5700 Ultra will basically get the same if not better results than the 9500 Pro does at 1024 by 768. So we can see that this 5700 Ultra did get its butt kicked a little bit by the 9500 Pro, a card which may I remind you came out two years before it. Same segment, two years older. If you ask me, the GDDR3 that was put on this card was completely wasted. Really, I honestly think that, again, this was a marketing ploy by NVIDIA, and it was also maybe a little bit of a test to make sure that GDDR3 was good to go, even though NVIDIA seemed pretty confident in it by that point. But to bear the title as the world's first GDDR3 GPU, this thing really is just kind of pathetic. Was the 5700 Ultra good for its time? It was okay. In its prime, when DX8 titles were rampant and only a few DX9 titles were out there, it was certainly a really good card and it did outperform the ATI equivalents, but DX9 was quickly taking over, and as you've seen firsthand here, this card just can't keep up. With all that said, thanks for listening to me rant for the last little while and joining me on this little adventure. What do you think of the 5700 Ultra GDDR3? Was this some sort of marketing ploy by Nvidia, or was it justified? Do you think the GDDR3 was wasted on here, or did that little overclocking potential that it have actually justify this product being put on the market and being a viable product to purchase if you kind of wanted to future-proof your PC? Let me know in the comments below. Are you on a bonus? This video almost didn't happen, for several reasons. Let's start with the first reason. Basically, I bought this item from Mercari Japan, which means I needed to use a proxy service to order the item on my behalf and then ship it to me. Along the way, when the item left for Canada, it seemingly got lost. To make matters worse, not long after it got lost, our entire country's postal system decided to say, F you guys, we're going on strike. So basically for three months, I had no idea what was gonna happen with this item. The postal strike only lasted one month, but even after that, the item just sat and did nothing. There were no updates, it just said it had left for Canada and there was absolutely nothing going on. Then one day it randomly showed up on my doorstep. Problem number two, the card looked like it had sat in someone's shed and been through a tsunami. So obviously despite cleaning it up and replacing a couple knocked off capacitors, it did literally nothing when I plugged it in. On a whim because of how like quite literally crusty this card was, I figured maybe the solder balls for the core have oxidized or cracked or something because the core wasn't getting hot at all. So I decided to reflow the card very carefully and I actually got to this point. That's awesome. That was a good start. But we weren't out of the woods yet. So I figured if the core also had this problem, well, the RAM probably has this problem too. Like, let's be honest. This is GDDR3. It doesn't even really need the heat sinks that come with it. It runs very cool. This is good stuff. There's no possible way that the VRAM on this thing is dead. So I carefully reflowed the memory chips and we got to this point. I gave them another reflow. And then we got to this point. Despite all my great efforts, the card is still not 100%. In my AGP test bench, I need a Molex extension cable because the Molex connectors on that power supply are kind of over-engineered and they don't really make good contact with the pins that the card needs for power. Also, when I was testing Fear for the first time, as soon as I enabled DX8 shaders, the card started artifacting like crazy. It has never done this in any other game, and I wasn't able to replicate this issue by turning on DX8 shaders again. So I don't really know what's going on, but what I do know is that at least the card is performing as best as it can. For how much longer, I don't know, but who cares.